أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم النبيين والمرسلين محمد بن عبد الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحابته أجمعين ومن استنى سنتهم واهتدى بهديهم وتبعهم بخير وإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد الله سبحانه وتعالى سد الذين آمنوا وتطمئن قلوبهم بذكر الله ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب الله سبحانه وتعالى said the believers are the, the, the ones who feel peace in their hearts when they do dhikr indeed by the dhikr of Allah سبحانه وتعالى hearts should feel peace This is the sign of Iman, or one of the important signs of Iman. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned other signs in other ahadith. Uh, one Sahabi asked Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi what is the sign of Iman? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, إِذَا سَرَّتْكَ حَسَنَتُكَ وَسَاءَتْكَ سَيِّئَتُكَ فَأَنْتَ مُؤْمِنٍ when you do hasana, you feel happy. And when you do sayyah, you feel guilty, then you are mu'min. How much happy you feel when you do good deed and how much guilty and sad uh, and ashamed you feel when you do a sin. This depends on how, how strong your iman is. But the most important sign of iman is what is mentioned in the ayah. When you feel in your heart peace when you do dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the definition of dhikr? Dhikr is coming from the word dhakara. Dhakara is to mention something. Is to mention something. Uh, and dhakara is to remind with something. So what is the meaning of dhikr? The, the, the actual concept of dhikr? Anything you do or anything you say or anything you are part of that reminds you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, this is dhikr. And this is what most people think about when we, we, talk, we say dhikr. Many Muslims, they think it, it's only those, this adhkar, when you say tasbih, when you say alhamdulillah, when you say Allahu Akbar, when you say la ilaha illallah, when you say subhanallah wa bihamdih, subhanallah al -azim. When you make istighfar, astaghfirullah, uh, all of these are types of dhikr. But dhikr is not only this. Re reciting the Quran is dhikr. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi said, Afdal dhikri qiraatul Quran. Quran recitation is the best dhikr because these are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any lecture you attend about Islam, like th this lecture that we are having now, this is also dhikr. When you attend khutbat al-jum'ah, this is dhikr. When you talk with your friends, brothers and sisters, about deen, about Islam, when you, uh, with your husband or your wife at home, you read the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, because who is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the messenger of Allah. And we learn from his seerah how to be good Muslims. This is also dhikr. So anything that is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything that you do or anything that you say with connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you go and make da'wah, for example, when those brothers who go and make da'wah in the street and give some uh, flyers and uh, and talk to people about Islam. This also dhikr. 
So dhikr is a very general concept. Ala bi dhikrillahi taqumainu al-qulub. What do you feel when you do dhikr? There are some dhikr which are obligations, like the salah. The salah is also dhikr. The five prayers, they are dhikr. So there are some types of dhikr that you have to do. You have to do. It is fard. And the daily dhikr that is fard is the five prayers. You have to do those. There is no other daily dhikr that you must do other than the five prayers. Other things like tasbih after salah, to say, to say subhanallah 33 times, alhamdulillah, Allahu akbar, 33 times, to make dua, to, read, to, to recite Quran, all of these things are good to do. You will be rewarded, but they are not compulsory. So when you do the five prayers, what do you feel? Do you feel that your heart is relaxing? Because what is the meaning to feel peace? Is to feel that you are relaxing. Your heart is relaxing. You are not doing any effort, but you are taking a break from the effort. Your heart is taking a break. Your heart and your brain both are taking a break. It's not something that is uh, putting a, a burden or a load on your brain or your mind, on, on your mind or your heart. You feel that it is a relief. This is the meaning of tatma'innu al-qulub. What the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about the salah, when the time of adhan comes, who is the Mu'addin is Bilal radiallahu anhu. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, Arihna biha ya Bilal. Oh Bilal, it's time for us to relax. Do the adhan so that we can have some break. Arihna biha is uh, it's coming from the word raha. Raha is to be, uh, is to have a break. Like a pausa. So the salah is the break that the heart needs to have. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say to Bilal Radiallahu Anhu, it's the time for the break. So make the adhan so that we make the salah, we do the salah. This is a sign of Iman. Or this is the main sign of Iman. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبُ there are two types of people who prays, who does the obligations. There is someone who does the obligations to, uh, to survive from Jahannam. And this is the target. I am doing it because it is fard. Because if, if, if I don't do it, it will be haram. I will be punished. So I have to do it. How do you know if you are one of those? Look at your salah. How long does it take you to pray? How fast are you praying? How focused are you in your salah? If you are not focused and you are praying so fast, then it is something that you want to get rid of, to get rid of. Even if you claim otherwise, I'm sorry to say you are not telling the truth. Because it doesn't seem that. It doesn't seem so. It doesn't seem that it is something that you enjoy. When you enjoy something, if you are eating some, some food that you enjoy, you will never eat it so quick because you want to taste, you want to show the food and you want to taste it. And you don't want to finish it quickly. But if you eat something very quickly, then it is something that you don't really enjoy. You just want to eat and do something else.
So look at your salah, how you do it. If it is not proper, then you are doing the salah because it is an obligation. Because you don't want to be punished. And this is a danger because it seems that your iman is not okay. The salah is not meant to be like this. It is not meant that you feel that you are forced to do it five times a day, otherwise you are, you are punished. It's not, it's not meant to be like this. It's meant to be a break for your heart, to have some connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day five times. This is the target of salah. So if it is not like this with you, then you are missing the point. And you are not benefiting of it. And if it is like this with you, then the shaitan will work on this weakness because it is a weakness. The shaitan knows all of your weaknesses. And when he finds this weakness, he will not leave it. He will work on it. So now you are praying on time. And then he will make waswasa to you to pray in time. Because there is a time period. The best time for, for, for doing the salah is on time, the time of Adhan, just when the, when the time of salah starts. For men to pray in the masjid, if you can, if you can't, to pray at home, but on time. And for women to pray at home, on time. But you can also pray in time, it is, all, it is also accepted. So the shaitan will let you delay the salah. And then the shaitan will let you collect the salah. And then it happens with other people that they collect the five prayers, which is, which is haram. The five prayers you cannot collect. And then the next step is to pray some of them and leave some of them. Uh, it, is, it is already Maghrib time. I didn't pray Asr. Okay, it is lost. So they pray some and leave some. And then pray nothing except Juma. And there are many Muslims who does this. And then pray nothing except Eid, two times a year. And there are many Muslims who does this. You never see them. They don't pray Fard and they come only for Eid, which is Sunnah. And then not to pray anything. So there are several steps. But the first danger that happens is when you, uh, when you don't feel the relaxation of Salah. When you don't feel that there is peace in your heart when you pray. This is a sickness. And how to treat this sickness? How to feel the salah? It is very simple. It needs an effort, but the, the idea itself is simple. The salah is a connection between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala five times a day. So if I tell you, you have to talk to some person five times a day, and you don't have really a connection with this person, you don't know each other well, you have nothing in common, you don't have any connection, 
or you rarely talk to each other. And now you have to talk to this person five times a day. It will be difficult because simply you don't have anything to say. You don't have any topic to talk. You will start uh, thinking about what, what should I talk to this person? I don't know him or I don't know her. So what, what should we talk about? I don't know what to talk about. So the question is, do you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Someone says, of course, I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us messengers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words are the Quran. All what is written in the Quran, what is in the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we recite Quran, we say what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives us rizq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who, hold on. I'm not saying what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made for you. I'm saying, do you know him? Do you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? Do you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How often do you do that? And when you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do you say? And here when I say, do you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I'm referring to something that we all know. It is called dua. Dua. So do you have dua? Because this is the way that you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, الدعاء مخ العبادة. The dua is the brain of ibadah. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in another hadith, الدعاء هو العبادة. The dua is ibadah. It means that it is the most important part of ibadah. Why it is like this? Because it is the way that you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the way that you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, what the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about the Quran, afdal al-dhikri qira'at al-Quran. What is the most important surah in the Quran? Surah al-Fatiha. And this is why we, 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 are, we have to recite Surah al-Fatiha in every rak'ah. 17 times every day, at least, if you don't pray any sunnah. If you look at Surah Al-Fatiha, all of, the, of Surah Al-Fatiha is dua. It is dua. Because in the Quran, there is some things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to do. Some things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us not to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu. Those are instructions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are some stories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about Bani Israel, about the prophets, about many people. And there is very important part of Quran. The most important is dua. So there are many duas which are coming from Quran, like رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِغْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَّابِ this is from Quran. Rabbana ufirli wa li walidayya wa lil mu'minina yawma yaqoom al-hisab. This is from Quran. Dua from Quran. And Surah Al-Fatiha is dua. It is from Quran and it is dua. First you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. You praise him. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Malik yawm al-Din. And then you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iyaka na'bu wa iyaka nasta'in. It's, who, it's you whom we worship and whom we ask help and support. And then you start asking him, guide us. 
Sirat al-lazina an'amta alayhim ghayri al-maghdubi alayhim wa la-dhalli. So it's pure dua. And it is the best dua in Qur'an. And it, because of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put this dua as Surah Al-Fatiha. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it Ummul Kitab. Ummul Kitab, the mother of the book, the mother of the Qur'an. So the dua is very important because it is the way that you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So do you have a special dua between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or let me ask you another question first. When you raise your hand to make dua, how long? How long do you make dua? When you are alone, not when there is an imam and he's making dua and you are saying ameen. No, only you. Not when there is an imam and you are, you are saying ameen and not when you are an imam, for example, or you are in a group and uh, the brothers or sisters ask you to make dua and they say ameen. So you have to make a, a general dua. You will not talk about your private stuff, about your personal stuff in the public because you have to make a general dua for everyone. And the imam or the, the, the lecturer, would, for example, when we finish the lecture today, we will make dua. I will make the dua, but I have to make a general dua. I will not mention my private stuff in this dua because this is something I don't want you people or anyone else to know. So not in these situations, but in the situation that you are talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is no one else listening. How long you make this dua? How long? One minute, two minutes? Five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour. How long? You should ask yourself this question. And as long as you make dua, as long as the dua is, it will show how convenient you feel when you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how strong the connection between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how much you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are some Muslims when they raise their hand to make dua they don't know what to say. They say some things that they memorize, like the du'as from the Qur'an that they memorize, one or two or three du'as, and they finish. And of course, these du'as are in, in Arabic because they are from Qur'an or they memorized it from some book. Some Muslims, they understand the meaning, and some of them, they don't even understand. So when they talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they say some things that they don't understand, but they, they know that these are from Quran or Sunnah, so they just say them. Which means that you don't have any personal connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing. It is just whatever general that you memorized. And some other Muslims, when they raise their hand, they can make a long dua. And they don't stop. Something or someone needs to stop them. For example, if it is before salah, one, one of the times of, of, uh, of acceptance of dua, there are some times Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that these are times of acceptance of dua. 
like in, in the in, in the in the Jumu'ah prayer, the, the the time that you enter the masjid until the uh, the salah is finished. All of this is time for acceptance. The time between adhan and iqama, it is time of acceptance. The time between you break your fast, before you break your fast, this is time of acceptance. The time uh, before Salat al-Fajr, time of acceptance. After you finish the Salat, time of acceptance. And sujood, when you are in sujood, you are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, uh, someone raised the adhan, and between adhan and iqama, there is 20 minutes. You can find someone sitting in the masjid. Just after the mu'adhan finishes the adhan, he raises his hand. For the whole 20 minutes, he's making dua, making dua, making dua. Doesn't stop until the mu'adhan say the iqama. If it is 20 minutes, if it is 30 minutes, he has a lot of things to say. So something has to stop him because when the iqama, he has to stop to, to, do, to join the jama'ah. And someone can start making dua before breaking fast in Ramadan, for example, uh, by 30 minutes or even one hour. And this person doesn't stop until the adhan in Maghrib, then he has to stop to break fast. So the, these two types of people exist. Some Muslims, they don't know what to say to Allah. And some people, they have a lot to say. They want to tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about everything, everything. And of course, this is a lot because you have a lot of things in your life that you want them to be, problems to be solved, wishes to be achieved, ambitions, a lot of things. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala kulli shayin qadir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who can make everything happen. So that second type of people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the closest to them. So their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stronger than their connection with, to their wives or husbands, their connection to their children, and their connection to their friends. And the first type of people, their connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is almost doesn't exist. They are Muslims, they do salah, they do but their personal connection, their private connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't exist. They don't have secrets with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So their connections with, their, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is weaker than their connections with their wives or husbands, their connections with their children, their connections with their friends, even weaker than their connections with their colleagues or people that they know. Because when you meet your colleagues in the lunch break, for example, you can talk about things. You can talk about football. You can talk about some political things. You can talk about the war in Ukraine. You can, you can talk about a lot of things. And you talk freely. And you stop because the, the lunch break is stopped, or you have a meeting or something. This is your colleagues, not even your friends. But when you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have nothing to say. So the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even weaker than the connection with the people that we have in the side part of our life. And because of this, those two things come together. The first time, that their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very weak, or they don't have any private connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will find that those people are the ones who do the prayer without enjoying it. Just because it is an obligation. They want to get rid of it quickly. They don't feel it. It's just a burden. 
And again, I'm not talking about the Muslims who miss who misses some who miss some prayers. I'm talking about the Muslims who pray five times. So both types are the Muslims who pray five times. But those, the first type, they pray five times without feeling them, without enjoying them. Why? Because they don't have a private connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other type, you will always find them enjoying the salah. And when the imam's voice is nice, they will cry. And sometimes when they make dua, they will cry. Because they, those tears, they come when you really feel what you are saying to Allah. And you, you are really feeling that someone is listening to you. Because we don't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't hear him. We have never seen or heard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We just believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. We believe that he's giving us everything, but this is not something that we can sense by our eyes or our ears. So when you make dua and you don't feel it, you don't really feel in your heart that someone is listening to you. You know in your mind, if I ask anyone who is making dua, do you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears what you are saying? You say, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears everyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees everyone and everything, if it, even if it is a small ant in, on, 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 on a stone and uh, the, the things that we all know. We, we know this by, by our brain, by our mind. But do, do you feel it when you make dua? Do you feel that someone, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is listening everything you say? When you pray and you say Surah Al-Fatiha, do you know that every, every ayah you say in Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to you, but you don't hear that, but you should feel that. The second type of people who really feel the dua, who have the private connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they really feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is listening to them. When they make the dua, they know, they feel, not they know because everyone knows, but they feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is listening to them. So every word, every sentence they say in the dua, they know, they feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is listening. He's listening. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not provide a response in voice when you make the dua. Because the dua is request. And when you make a request, you ask for a response. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give you a response in voice because if you uh, if you go and meet someone like uh, your boss or someone or the prime minister or whatever, and you have some requests, you submit a request, or even in, in, in the normal life for, or for those who are getting some things from NAV and you meet this uh, uh, Sax behandler or whatever the, the you submit requests to some creatures and you are awaiting responses and then they give you a response either in a in, in voice or a written response in an email or in the post so there is some some sense the response the response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not by this means but there is a response there is a response And the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in different shapes. The ones who have private connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they know. They know what this response is. If you ask me, 
what the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. This is something that I cannot tell you because it is different from some, from, from, from every person to another. All what I can tell you, you will know that this is a response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you. Something, you will get something. You will get something back when you make the dua in this way and you are feeling it when you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will get something back and you will know this thing that you got is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you said this dua. What is this thing? I cannot tell you. Because if something happens with me, it might not happen with you. It is something between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you cannot share with other people. Because it is different. It can be something in your heart. It can be something that you see. It can be something that you hear. It can be something that happens. It can be someone that does something for you. It can be a lot of things. But when you get this response, you will know in your heart that this response is from Allah for this dua that you did at this time. You will know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell you some way that this is a response for the dua that you did at that time. So when you make the dua in this way, you will get a response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not ignore you. But when you make the dua like, by just making dua, to make dua. You are making it and you are not feeling it. You are just making it like that. So you, what, what are you waiting for? You are just repeating some words, repeating, repeating, repeating something that you know, something that you memorize, but you don't, you don't have a feeling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may accept your dua and may give you something, but you will not get a response for every dua you make. الذين آمنوا وتطمئن قلوبهم بذكر الله ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب. So the key, the key to have peace in your heart when you do ذكر, when you pray, when you read Quran, when you recite Quran, when you make ذكر, even when you fast. When you attend a lecture to feel that your heart gets a break, it is to start if you don't have some brothers and sisters, they have this. And this is not something that you should tell people about. Some brothers and sisters, they already have this. And if you are one of them, you, of course, you know very well what I'm talking about. But if you don't have this, then you need to establish it, to establish the private connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To establish the private connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the question is how to do this? If it doesn't exist, how do I do it? I don't have it. How do I do it? You need to start talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First, you should feel ashamed that you are late. You should have done this so long time ago. You should feel first guilty and ashamed that you are so late. And 
if you want to start this, choose some time when you are alone. No one is with you. Whether you will be at home, you will be in the masjid, you will be in any place. But there is no one who will come to talk to you. No one will interrupt you. And then start thinking. And the first thing you should feel, as I said, feel ashamed that you are late. And start talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala freely with your language. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands whatever you will say. So don't feel shy to say it in your, you know, your mother tongue or your, or, or your street language or whatever. It doesn't really matter what you are saying on, or, or what dialect you are talking. Start talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala freely without any limitations, without any uh, phrasing or rephrasing or reforming of words to make them so nice and polite and of course you don't say any impolite words when you talk to, talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is obvious but say what you want to say without any reforming first to feel ashamed that you are late second to remember to remember what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have given to you. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you in your life? All the good things that you have. And to remember your sins. This is the first thing. Not to start asking for what you want. No, start with this. Number one, feeling ashamed that you are late. Second, remember how many blessings did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you? Your uh, qualifications, your education, your job, your salary, your family, your children, your house, all of the things. And first of all, to be a Muslim and remember your sins. And start making istighfar on these sins. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive your sins. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a lot of things and this is what you paid back. You are praying, alhamdulillah, you are paying your zakah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a lot of things. Some of them people know, some of them people don't know. And you have done a lot of bad things. So start first making istighfar, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you, because this is like the, the first, maybe it is not the first, but maybe if you are not used, it has been so long since you had a private talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you a lot of things every day every now and then, and you are forgetting to thank him, you are forgetting to talk to him. And you are doing a lot of sins. So start by feeling ashamed that you are late and then remembering the blessings and making still far from your sins. And do this several times. Do this several times. Until you feel 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is listening to you. You will get a response in your heart. I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying until you know, because you already know. In your mind, you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears you because he hears everyone. We all know that. But I'm saying until you feel, you feel, this is different. Until you feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is listening to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears you. And you know what? If you did this after not doing it for a long time or it, if it is the first time, when you really feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is listening to you and or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears you, you will cry. When you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings and your sins, and you really feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears you when you make istighfar, you will cry. And then you will not find an effort to continue your dua. Because the words will come from your heart. Telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about your problems, about your issues, about your, your problems with your, with your deen, how your iman is weak, how, is your, how you are not doing well as a Muslim, and your problems in life, your problems with whatever your job, your children, any difficulties that you have, you will, you will find that these are coming from your heart. You will not find an effort to bring the words. And then time by time, you will find yourself talking more and more to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and feeling more familiar you will find that you are getting more connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a stranger for you anymore. I mean for your heart. Because before he was for you a stranger. You know about him, but you don't talk to him. So after this, you will not feel this anymore. You will feel that you are familiar when you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will get this response in your heart. And then you will find other types of responses from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after this, the second step, you will build trust. You will build trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very important. If I ask any Muslim, do you trust Allah? Of course, I trust Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala kulli shayin qadir. We know this. But do we feel this? The answer is no, not most people, they don't feel that. They don't feel this trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you know why? Because when you come in a, diff a very difficult situation, do you make dua first or you call someone first? So, to whom you go first? You go to the ones that you, or the, the one or the ones that you believe that they will help you. Because it is not by talking. It's not by saying, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than everyone. It's not by talking, it's by practicing. And some situations, they test your uh, sincerity or your truth, truthfulness about this, or either you are uh, say uh, you are saying the truth or not. So you will build then the trust in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. 
because you have seen the responses. You have felt the responses. You feel that Allah, you feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. We know already that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always with us and is watching over us and is taking care of us. But then you will start feeling this. Feeling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears you and is listening to you. Feeling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to you. And feeling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching over you. And feeling that you trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these things every Muslim know. Every Muslim knows. But not every Muslim feels. And this is on you. I told you how to start it. But no one will do it for you. You will do it for yourself. If you don't do it, it will not happen. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Man taqarraba minni shibran taqarrabtu min hudiran. If you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by shibr, this distance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come to you by dhira' this distance. The, 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 the length of the arm. So you have to come to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. And then the response will come. So if you come a small distance to Allah, Allah will come to you a larger distance. And this is the response that I'm talking about. Something in your heart, something that you see, something that you hear, someone, something that happens and you feel that it is a response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you have to start. And then this will solve all of your Iman problems. This is the key for solving all of your Iman problems. Because you have a private connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a private relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that no one else knows about. Only between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you make dua, you know what to say. And you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know him. You know him very well. He's not a stranger for you anymore. It's not that you know him as a, uh, our God, our creator. Our... It's not like this. Because it is very different. When you hear about the prime minister of Norway, you know that those are the, this is the leader of the government. These are the ones who are uh, ruling the country. But you never really know the person. You never met the person. You don't have any personal connection with the person. So a lot of people, they like the, the prime minister. Other people, they don't like. But a lot of people, they like. This is why they elected him. They voted for him because they like him. They like him, but do they know him? Have they ever met him? No. But this is a creature. Our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one have ever met or seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But by this dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a response if you follow the steps that I mentioned. Establish the private connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, feeling the response, having your uh, private conversations with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then establishing the trust to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then everything will be fixed. Your salah will be fixed. Your tasbih will be fixed. Your fasting will be fixed. And then everything in your life will be fixed. You will not, you will never have a depression, ever. You will not have a, you will never have a frustration, ever. You will always feel peace in your heart because you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. So you will get less nervous. You will get less uh, pressure. You will always have peace in your heart. 
not only when you make ibadah, when you do ibadah, but also in your work life, in your social life, in everything. There's a question here. Saying gas. So if you yeah, this is yeah, this is what I wrote to you about in Masjid Al Aqsa. They yeah. pray Qasr uh, Salah for every salah, Dohran, uh, Asr, and Maghrib and Isha, and even people from Jerusalem, they pray that. How and why is so in Jama in, in yeah they make Asr in congregation. So how do they pray? It? They, yeah, uh, they when they pray Maghrib, three Maghrib and uh, two Isha. And uh, uh, Salat al Jamal, and then after that, two Asr. And every day they do that. Maybe because of the size, because there are too many people. What do you mean, too many people? So they cannot make just one Jamal? Ah? No, no, it's not uh, nothing. It's, it's, it's shortening, it's joining and praying, like when we are traveling. Oh, that Jama is what, oh, yeah, that's what they do. You know, uh, the tra when traveling, you join and pray, and that they do that in Al Aqsa. And, uh, and they also do the regular five times at the, uh, in its time. But, uh, you know, there are the people from Jerusalem, Al Quds, also doing the, the, the joining and praying. I can try to find out. Uh, yeah, I wrote to you. But, uh, well, at that time, uh, I couldn't answer. But uh, ask anybody there. But uh, is that special for them? Because Makkah, Medina, they don't do that. Even though 75% of the people uh, are travelers there is no special role but i mean if, if the question is if, if there is a special role for masjid al-aqsa for, for for making jam and qasr no there is no there is no special role for masjid al-aqsa so uh, but you have, do you know why they are doing it they must have a reason so either the, the those people they are from outside the city uh, uh, or they are from parts of the city which are too far so this this is the only reason if they shorten the salah, if they shorten the salah, if, if, if they pray asr and dhuhr two instead of four, they must be from outside because they cannot be from uh, living in, 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 in the city and they are praying uh, qasr. Jama, collecting the salah without shortening, there can be other excuses other than uh, traveling. But qasr, it must be for traveling. No other excuse for it. Mm. So this is the only reason, because there is no special rule for al-Masjid al-Aqsa uh, to make uh, jama and qasr always. There is no such a rule. Mm. Because I have, uh, I have to, uh, sisters on that side, this side, uh, who was from uh, Jerusalem also uh, doing that. Did you make sure that they are from, from there? Yeah, I asked them. Yeah. Then you should have asked them, uh, or if you know them, you can ask them why, because there is no reason for that. Uh, maybe they are from, uh, from, uh, from Al-Quds, uh, but, uh, but maybe they are not living there now. Yeah, that may be. But uh, they said they're from, uh, uh, when I asked them, they said they're from... Uh, uh, Jerusalem. Yeah. By the way, we call it Al Quds, not Jerusalem. Quds, yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. 
det är not everybody here may be remember could say the moment that could and yeah okay still uh, still i feel that there must be some other reason that yeah there has to be a reason because there is no yeah, yeah. for masjid al yes because of i was thinking that it's uh, uncertainty uh, life is not difficult life is not easy there for palestinians right we all know that so when they come and they don't know whether they'll go back whether they can come back again, even even it. in war even if there is war the prayer has to be done i mean the, the the only the only other condition where the where the salah has to be qasr you, you know shortened mm. in war so when there is a, a war happening the salah has to be done so part of the army is fighting mm -hmm. and the other part of the army is praying behind and then uh, the, the 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 part of the army who's praying they pray part of the salah and then they go forward to fight, and then the, the ones who are fighting, they go back and continue the Salah. But other than those two conditions, the, the, the Safar and, uh, and war, there is no other shortening uh, for the Salah. Yeah, we should find out a little bit more why. Uh, yeah, I think the best thing is to, is to ask someone. I can also try to ask someone from there. Yeah, I can. I made some contacts, but at that time, my mind didn't go to ask them why. But then I realized because uh, we did it as well because we were travelers. So, but they also do five times in its time as well. They do also Asr at Asr time and uh, Isha at Isha, Isha time also. And at the same time, after Maghrib, they'll do uh, in congregation. So they at Asr time they pray normal. They also do that, but after uh, Duhr, also they'll uh, pray. Oh, we were there for yeah. So ah, that's so why they, I was. They do the salah normal, but some people yeah. after, after. But after. they do it in congregation, uh, even the kasr. And they do in congregation, of, of course, the five salah. They do both in congregation. I'm wondering, I, uh, I mm. just I was listening to this. I'm thinking, is it because of, of the uncertainty, brother? Because the, it is a war situation there, and the Israeli soldiers are always there. So they don't know whether they can come and pray the Asr prayer again, so that they mm. combine the Lohor and Asr. Yes, maybe. After, and it is allowed, yes. If 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 you, if you, if, if, if there are some excuses other than suffer where you can collect the prayers. Yeah, yeah, that's what Not I'm wondering because it, uncertainty, yeah. uncertainty. It is uncertain there. Nobody knows next minute what's going to happen. Mm. Uh, so maybe that, but it, yeah. Yes, and if, if I you want to pray her. also in, 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 the, in Masjid Al-Aqsa because it is uh, for 500 Salah, if you pray there. Mm. Mm. So if they pray I both think, I think every home. Muslim who gets an opportunity should go there. Mm. Only after going, I myself realized uh, what everything is. It's, uh, yeah, you can talk for others to relate stories of that place. Uh, I never thought of anybody else at that while I was there, not even myself. I just made two of Aksa and people there. Mm. The, it, it's bad. So, Do you have some something special to share about what you have seen? Uh, yeah, the, the the people uh, we were coming out of uh, after Isha. And those people, the, the, the Orthodox Jews and the other Jews, they are freely, freely walking into the Aqsa complex. And I did, we didn't go at morning, 8 o'clock, but some of the sisters said, if you come at 8 o'clock in the morning, you can see them in the Aqsa compound, singing and chilling out the whole area, Aqsa area. There are in tons who come 
and they do that. At uh, that time, we didn't see it our own eyes, but uh, now some of the sisters who told you come there around eight o'clock, you can see them just to provocate the Palestinians. Mm. But subhanAllah, Palestinian people in Palestine, some resilience they have and their level of Iman is in another level. Yeah. If you if you're very if you're very ignorant and don't know what's going on in Palestine, and when you see those brothers and sisters, you would never imagine that they're they they are under occupation. Mm. You won't. And they're they are they are spending hours in the masjid, they are praying, they are asking God. They, when you see them asking dua. That what that's when you see them. What comes out of their heart? Heart. Uh, it's it was really touchy to see them asking dua. And uh, also, we uh, we saw with our own eyes the open air prison. We didn't go to Gaza. Gaza is uh, slightly a little bit bad than what we saw in uh, the West Bank. Uh, the uh, the Nab Nablus. Now we didn't go right up to Nablus, but. Uh, in uh, Bethlehem, that area. I mean, the big wall goes with the terrain. We saw that. The Palestinians are covered with wall. They cannot move. They cannot come to al Aqsa. Mm. They have to get a visa, and that visa can take five, six, ten days, or you'll never get the visa. And yeah. they get for one or two months, whereas we, with the Norwegian passport, we were allowed to we are allowed to say three months. Who are we? Palestinians, that's their country. Mm. And those people with all that trouble, they're coming, they came, they were coming from Haifa, Ramallah, Hebron, uh, all those places. So it's yeah. And ninety percent, it's uh, Palestinians who are there. Yes, it's uh, very, very few tourists like us who are there. Very, very few. So it's there to to preserve, preserve. I don't know the rocks I will be anyway preserved, isn't it? Uh, so, but uh, to keep Al-Aqsa alive, it's Palestinians who are fighting alone. If nobody comes there, it will be just a walkthrough for the those occupiers to go through. Mm. It's it's uh, I myself we all we know all these stories, but until I saw it with my own eyes, never it doesn't it doesn't go into you. And uh, it's uh, I don't know it's. Uh, yeah, the, the, everything we saw, the open air prison we saw, and uh, the and when you listen to those sisters, the, I I only spoke to the sisters, obviously. They, if you ask them one question, they have an answer for half an hour. Mm. They are not afraid to tell their situation. There was once we were coming out in the alley, and. Uh, one one brother who was a vendor, he said, sister, sister, come in. You don't have to buy anything, just give baraka. And then we went inside and then we bought, obviously we bought some things from there. And then he told us to come out to the street and he was telling what's going on. And there were three Israeli soldiers, uh, right about three meters away. I was telling Mackie in, in my language, just listen because you don't know. But that way, he was not afraid to tell. Mm. And he was openly telling, you know, you are blessed. It's Allah's invitation that you are here. Uh, and uh, all those things. And, uh, oh, it's, uh, it's, I don't know, it's very touchy to be there. We all know, you know, we have seen on TV, we saw, but to go and listen to those people on the ground. It's it's different. It's different. I I just forgot about myself and the things that we have to ask for ourselves. Dua. I just forgot. Because so uh, to see those people, you know. But in that smiling face, I met another sister. Her son was taken out. They had come to the university and taken him 
uh, and he's still in prison. And the smile that sister has, and he, she's sending her other son to the same university. I asked, aren't you afraid to send him to the same university? No, but those two boys are different. So it's, uh, and still they have this smile on their face, you know. So what do we have to complain here? Nothing. Hmm. So I would, I would tell anybody because American, UK, European passports uh, can go easily. The, 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 can go. We are how, very, very, how, very did you, how did you uh, enter? So it was through Jordan or? Jordan, Jordan. We went through the, the King, George, King Hussein, King Hussein uh, crossing. And uh, for us, of course, we got an agent to do it for us. So we didn't have to do anything. They took us through the VIP border. And VIP the agent you, you found in Jordan? Yeah, yeah. That's the same, uh, same agent that who did the Jordan trip for us. It's them. Uh, we had the same driver right throughout. Yeah, they are the people who did our Jordan trip from the airport to back to the airport. So the same people did the Palestine trip as well. Mm. So they, we didn't have to do anything. Their representative was at the border and they did everything and put us in the shuttle bus and then sent us uh, to the other side and just about the security and the passport. We had to have the loan. But uh, altogether it took only two hours, two and a half hours maximum from the hotel to we met the Palestinian driver on the other side. The driver mm -hmm. was waiting for us with our name. And he said, you are the first Muslims who came out so fast. Mm. Uh, so it, it means that they, uh, for the other ones, they may stop for, for asking. Uh, they, yes, they don't ask questions. They, the driver was selling, they just tell you, sit down and wait. And you can wait for hours, the driver was saying. They don't tell anything, they don't do anything, but they just to harass Muslims. They just ask you to sit and wait. But uh, we didn't have that experience. But there was a British guy, young fellow, he came with us in the same uh, shuttle bus. He said he was asked many questions, but then I understood that there are a lot of Western journalists who are pro-Palestinians, which they don't like, obviously. When mm. they suspect, then they harass them. Mm. But, uh, it is possible for us with UK passport, US passport, and European passports. Because in this border, uh, in this border, uh, checkpoints in in, uh, in West Bank and all, we were stopped. Many, many places we were stopped. But they look at the passport and they look at this, they give a little cheat, like a bus ticket. And in that says you can stay until October or something, something. So once they looked at it, they just closed the border, uh, passport and we asked to go. But Palestinians? No, mm. no, there's no way they can come into Aqsa. There are lots of people. Our driver in Jordan, he's Palestinian, but now having Jordanian passport, he says he has not been since he was five years old, something, but he cannot go. If he wants to go, he has to go to the Israeli embassy, and then that is something that Muslims don't want to do, to, to endorse Israeli as a state. So he said that he doesn't want to go to the Israeli embassy and get the visa. But he's Palestinian, he cannot go from Jordan, having Jordanian passport. But we, who am I? Who are we? We can just go because of this orange passport. I know they didn't put uh, this visa. Uh, uh... No, 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 no. I would have turned back if they were going to put a visa. I told that. I told our guide, if they're going to put the stamp, I'm going to turn back. Uh, the, but they give a little piece of paper. Uh, oh, I, I forgot to show you yesterday. Uh, little like a bus ticket, Sri Lankan type bus ticket. Uh, that's, that says we can enter and to oh. stay on in three months. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's so all. We don't, that's... we don't stamp in the passport, but they give you some piece of paper. Yeah, yeah, they just small, the small, like a bus ticket. Yeah, a small piece of paper they give you, and they stamp on that piece of paper, not on the passport. Mm, mm. There's no trace 
whatsoever in our, in our passports that we have been there. Mm. Mm. They just in that piece of paper, short, small, like a masticated piece of paper in that they stamp. Okay, so even if someone takes a trip, for example, from, from here to, to Tel Aviv or whatever, it should be- Same, same, same. It's the same. They, they don't, uh, they don't stamp on the passport, at least not ours. Uh, I don't know some other countries that they do. I think Jordanian, for example, they'll have to get it on their passport. Mm. I know if I think if you apply from here and go, maybe we have to take because you all went through there just uh, through that VIP lounge or whatever it is. Maybe that's VIP right. service. Yes. I don't know. Let me, I'll check and see. Because I know some uh, one couple who went uh, Christian. I told you yesterday, uh, the Christian couple who went and some years ago, I'll check with them whether they got it stamped on the passport. Yeah. So uh, I have an American passport, but 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 the, the idea that I have had before is that I didn't want to go because of that you have to enter there by the permission from the the, the, the mm -hmm. state that, that that we feel that it is illegal. But what, what you mentioned now, just like no, no, the, the, always UK and US has always been uh, visa free. Yeah, yeah, but but it has to be with their permission. But what you mentioned, no, at the border, the, uh, only at the border, yeah. only at the border, they give this piece of paper yes. with a stamp. The main argument. Uh, what I what I what I got to know from you now is the masjid. I mean, if if the Palestinians they have these difficulties entering the masjid, and if no yeah. other Muslims who have the the the, the, the possibility to go, uh, then it will be just left out for the for the for those groups. That's what I say. Yes. Yeah. Because that is what I say. I, I said say that Palestinians are fighting alone. Mm -hmm. they are coming, I met uh, for Isha time. I met a family who came from Haifa North with a ten-year-old baby. Yes. And they were going back, and it's not easy for them to go back and all these things. But still, they are coming from North, South, East, West, just mm -hmm. to have. Uh, is there a hadith that say the, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told? Muslims, we have to go to Al-Aqsa. If we cannot go, at least send some oil to light the lamp. Is that true? Yeah, there is one hadith, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, and yeah, uh, it's, you know, we who have been to Mecca, Medina, and those masjids are so elaborate and nice and expansion. And this Aqsa to see, you know, the window, you know, some years ago, the Israeli army put a bomb inside by in Ramadan, that window is still broken. Mm. Who is going to fix it? They cannot do anything. And you, know, and this you, better, you, you forgot to tell this also. Uh, for right. Brother must know this. When he goes and he asks, uh, which country have you got come to? Don't tell Palestine, must tell Israel. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, our driver, he coached that, uh, he told when we are going, because they to provoke, they put that word Israel when they see a Muslim. Uh, to me, they asked, uh, is this the first time in Israel? Uh, I just said yes. Uh, because if you say Palestine, then you choose your destiny. Uh, so they provoke to the maximum. Yes, so, this, is but, of, this is one of the reasons that I, I have not gone because I, 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 I'm not sure how my response will be. Uh, so, but the uh, Aqsa is left alone. Mm. Who is going to protect except Allah? Yes. yes. Because those it's people great. are there. They are going freely into the Aqsa complex with the, those orthodox hats and the cap and what. They're just freely, and those Palestinians around there, they are, they are behaving normal as ever. They're laughing, they're talking, they're just ignoring these people going. You can't stop them. And they're going, they're going, and they're going, and going inside the Aqsa complex. Yes. So it's very... 
So that's what I felt that these Palestinians are fighting alone for Al-Aqsa. Mm. The, just to keep that alive, they are coming with all difficulties. And I met, I spoke to many, many sisters, mashallah, they all speak English and I managed to establish some contacts from the ground, even to help them directly, it's easy. Mm. Yeah, you know, instead of going through that, this, this, that, oh, alhamdulillah, I got a chance of establishing direct contact with some people. So, I don't know, this is my story. After coming, it's just like, you know, like, you know. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, in Mecca, Medina, you can uh, easily go alone and uh, here you don't feel like. Mm. Cause they are there, right up to the entrance of the um, Al-Aqsa complex. They are in groups, in huge guns waiting. Every gate, at every gate, from the start to the end to the middle to everywhere, they are in groups, carrying huge guns. And uh, yeah, I mean, we didn't have any problem. We were stopped at uh, a checkpoint and they saw the passport and went. But that doesn't mean that it's a bed of roses for others. So, I mean, even our driver, he was not afraid to go and show each and every house, occupied house. He showed us. Those on the top of the mountain, it's like those California houses. But whereas in the Palestinian area, it's shanty. Old. Yeah. Yes. So even we saw, we went to that uh, Sheikh Jabra. Remember last year that uh, that it was attacked. Sheikh Jabra in uh, just in the outskirts of Jerusalem, in the west side, I think. Uh, it was attacked last year. Where a little bit of okay Palestinians live. It was all attacked last year. And we passed that area and went. Also, that Deir Yassin that was attacked in 1964, yes. 67. Yeah, we saw that area also. So, it's, uh, yeah. So anybody who have a chance, please go and I will go again if I can go. Uh, Inshallah, let's all make dua, lots of dua to protect our laksa and I don't know. Judgment day is near. Yes, it's important, at least just for the masjid. I mean, we, we are beyond the point that not to recognize the, the illegal state, but now yeah. it is in danger itself. So yeah, like, that's the that's the issue. You know, I learned something. I learned something from the Jordanian people. They never use this word Israel. They always say occupied land. You know, from Jordan, from north, east, until south, from everywhere you can see that land. We saw even from a 20 meter distance. Mm. You can see and they'll show you and tell you that is the occupied land. This is occupied land. This is occupied land. I never heard them say Israel. Yes. One time, mm -hmm. There's, uh, it's a principle, yes, yeah. And the driver was, we never used it either, so he was telling us, you know, don't use the word Israel, it is occupied land. Mm. But they know the pain, you know, they're so close by. Jordan is in the middle of the fire, yes, the occupied land on one side, Syria on the other side, so they're able on this side, Iraq on that side. So, but still, you feel safe in that country while you're there. No problem. So, yeah. And another thing you wanted to ask about Shweib Alaihissalam? Ah, uh, uh, yeah. You know the the Prophet Shweib and whom Prophet Musa got married to are they the daughter, father of Prophet Musa's wife. Yeah, are they the same people? Same Shuaib? Yes. 
most the likely Prophet... some, some ulama said it was not the, the uh, it was not him, but most ulama said it was Shuaib yes. Yeah, so there is two opinions. Yeah, because I also thought it was Shuaib but then until recently I, I heard from somebody else that no, it was another Shuaib, pious mm -hmm. person. Uh, most okay. ulama are they, they are saying that it was him. It was Shuaib okay. the Prophet Shuaib, yes. Hmm. So this, uh, you know, the Aqsa, the dome, dome of the rock, it's literally dome of the rock. Uh, that dome is built on top of that rock, right? They yes. say Prophet ascended. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we went inside there and they, the, many people who pray to Raqqa, uh, because hmm. the rock is very visible. You can see the rock. Yes. This was the, 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 the what what Ibrahim alayhi salam was using as sutra when he used to pray towards Kaaba. Um, uh, yeah. And and uh, uh, yeah, but that was built by the fifth Khalifa, huh? son. The, the, uh, the dome, not, not the fifth. around the dome on top of the rock was built by uh, Abdul Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Alu Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Yes. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah, because that the rock is there, but that area of the Salah where the Prophet led the prayers for the other prophets, that's a small area. Mm. Yeah, it's the Masjid al Aqsa. Uh, uh, that is big. That's big, yeah. quite big. It's uh, and the whole whole area, the complex is very big. I mean, when you went for Juma, we couldn't get a place. We got a yeah. place outside. Did you pray in the also in the Masjid with the with the green dome? Yeah, yeah, there, all just because we went like five minutes before the Azan, so it was, uh, but, but that Moroccan, Moroccan gate or Moroccan wall or what they call it, they broke to you expand the Western wall. Mm. That, that small green gate is only there. Mm. The, it's everything is broken. They have taken it uh, for their Western wall. The, yeah. Uh, Maryam alayhi salam. She uh, she was given a mihrab in this mosque, isn't it? Yeah, her mihrab was in that area. Yes. In that area. That was the there. mosque that uh, that was the mosque that was uh, not the mosque, the temple, right? Suleiman's temple. Yeah, it was. It was always a masjid. So it is the the, the Jews. They say it. It is a temple, but it is always a masjid. Uh, yeah. So, so what, what, Salam, he built a masjid. It was not a temple. Yeah, but that was it. That temple that was broken once, and then they built it again, and now that's what they are fighting for to build the third temple. Yeah, this is what they call a temple. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it is the whole area, the whole uh, compound. The whole yeah, compound. yeah, whole compound. It's a large compound. It's a big area. All of this was the masjid that Suleiman Salam built. Yeah. So, yeah. And the Christians claim that uh, Jesus was crucified in that area. That's why they say it's important for them. Yes, but it is not true. Yeah, true. yeah, yeah, of course not true. So, I mean, even the one who was crucified, it was it yeah. is not true that it is in this area. Yeah. So that's their reason for saying that. Uh, but I don't think there are, there are many Christians who are interested to go there. Not there, but there are many in Bethlehem area. Lots of them. Mm. Lots and lots and lots of them in the Bethlehem area. But Isa Nabi was not uh, crucified there, no? It was the small he, hillock. He was not crucified at all, but but, uh, yeah, but he was not the one crucified. Who was crucified no, in this place, it was not. It was not. Not that. him. I mean, they, they mean uh, that the crucifixion. Yeah, 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 the person who was crucified. Crucified, yeah. So, jazakum Allah khair. Jazakum Allah khair for this experience. It was very useful. Jazakum Allah khair. Yeah, yeah. Yes, inshallah, we should consider that. Yeah. Inshallah. Inshallah. Yeah. Right, okay. Right, inshallah.
يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك اللهم صل على محمد في الأولين وفي الآخرين وفي الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين اللهم قسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقواتنا ما أحييتنا وجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا وانصرنا على من عادانا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا منتهى أملنا ولا تسلط علينا من لا يرحمنا اللهم اشف مرضانا ومرضى المسلمين وارحم موتانا وموت المسلمين واكشف الهم والغم والكرب عنا وعن المسلمين اللهم اكفنا بحلالك عن حرامك وأغننا بفضلك عمن سواك ولا تحوجنا ولا تذلنا إلا إليك ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا اغفر لنا ولوالدينا وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب وصل لهم على محمد وآله وصحابته وتابعين خير وإحسان إلى يوم الدين آمين. Uh, I want to ask him as